everybody, and welcome to Chisholm Hale's How to Work Together Commission by Ahmet Oud, which is called Happy Together, Collaborators Collaborating. As you know, we're filming you all today in a discussion that Ahmet has designed, working with 10 collaborators that have been involved in projects that he has made with them over the past decade, from all over the world. Um, they come from lots of different professions. I will be introducing them one by one in a minute. What we hope to develop today, working with you all, and we encourage your participation towards the end of this event, what we're doing is we're asking questions about that collaboration. So what we want to know is, how did that collaboration affect the collaborators, but also how it made them feel in terms of an experience of contemporary art, of conceptual art, but also how it made them feel in terms of their relationship to the artwork. <coughs> did it make them feel in control? Did it help make them feel powerful? Did they experience a loss of power and a loss of control? Did they feel like authors? Did they feel that they had authority? Or did they feel that the artist re retained all of those things for himself? Ahmed is in the audience today, but he's not going to join in with the discussion. He has made this rule for himself, and we're not going to ask him to join in with the discussion today. We're going to answer all the questions ourselves. So this is effectively the revenge of the collaborators today, OK? So without further ado, I'm going to get on and invite our first uh, collaborator, Dan Urak, to come up to the table with me. Thank you very much for coming today. So first of all, to tell people that you're a sportscaster, you have in the past worked with Eurosports, and you're based in Istanbul. And you were part of the uh, Ahmed production, or uh, Ahmed project, 203 Mehmet Yildiz. Yeah? That's true. And we are, uh, so I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. But first of all, could you tell me a little bit about what brought you into sportscasting? Actually, I was a journalism student when I started 10 years ago. And I wasn't expecting to do anything with sports at all, but I saw this ad for Eurosport. I needed a job to finance my studies because I wanted to uh, advance my studies. So, and my family, by the way, who are all women, are into all kinds of sports, boxing, Olympic games, figure skating, etc. So uh, I, I was kind of, uh, you know, fit for this job and I started and it turned into a small career and fun career for me and uh, it helped me a lot for my studies as well. Because you're a PhD candidate studying sports sociology. Yes, yeah? at the okay. University of Strasbourg. And how's it going? Fine, painful, but <laughs> fine. As they always are. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about this work, 203 Mehmet Yildiziz. Yildiz means star in Turkish, right. yeah? That you've told me previously. Could you explain to us what that work was and what your part in it was? Ahmet approached me uh, about this project, uh, telling me that I wasn't aware before. Uh, there are more than 2,000 Mehmet Yildiz, uh, both sharing the uh, surname and the forename. And 203 of them are actually football players from the top division to the lower division. So uh, he asked me if I could commentate a football game, a hypothetical football game of 90 minutes with uh, those two hypothetical teams, oh, uh, Mehmet Yildiz's. And I just uh, suggested maybe we can just use the referees as Mehmet Yildiz as well, because there are also six referees who are named Mehmet Yildiz. So we, we proceeded into that. I mean, uh, we had this 90-minute recording of a football game. It wasn't a hypothetical game. It was a real game. I was watching a real football game. But which... which game was it? It was an old game from African Cup of Nations, so it had nothing to do with the project. No, no but Mehmet Yildiz. No. no. <laughs> but I needed something to commentate on. And my understanding is that there was a, there was a, a drawing that the artist, Ahmed, made a drawing of all of these different Mehmet Yildiz's, and these were life drawings. They were, yes. they were 
their, their own portraits. Yes, yeah, so, uh, it was uh, it was like the other half of the apple, and I wasn't aware of the drawings before the project, so okay. I was just imagining my own Mehmet Yildiz, but obviously Ahmed's version was much cuter. <laughs> I know, but um, so so that's interesting. So how much did Ahmed actually tell you about the project? How informed were you, or was it like blind? Well, partly, uh, because I knew what I had to do, but I didn't know how uh, it would have been integrated into the project. For example, I didn't know that my voice would uh, be transmitted through uh, an old radio uh, in, the, uh, in the exhibition. Uh, so, uh, by the way, I've never seen the project myself either, oh. no, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm still not 100% clear, but he promised me to show it when I'm in Istanbul. <laughs> what, do, what do you feel about not having actually seen the final result? It is kind of weird, actually, but being part of it is sometimes more than enough because I know that Ahmed is happy with my work. I was happy with uh, this project and I, I saw the drawing and I know my work as well. So I'm pretty sure that it was more than satisfying. And so getting Ahmed's approval, is that important to you? Well, of course, because he approached me for this work and it was a brilliant idea, if you ask me. So I wanted to take part of it. So uh, when, when I, I uh, commit myself to do something, uh, I, I, I want to, I feel myself compelled to do a good job. And uh, well, after the recording, Ahmed was uh, very happy because we had a very flawless, very smooth recording. 45 minutes of two parts. Yeah, it was fun and very smooth. So your experience is a good one of collaborating with Ahmed or being an Ahmed collaborator. Yes, I mean, it was a very uh, valuable project for me because uh, sports casting was not really a career for me and I quitted it like uh, a couple of months ago to go through with my PhD studies. Uh, so I wanted to do something uh, remarkable in that, you know, mock career of mine. Uh, so this is something I cherish. Uh, this, this is a good project. I, I, I, I'm proud of saying that I was in it. Very nice. Dan, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So, Tess Posthumus, you are a mixologist. You make cocktails for a living. Can't think of anything better than that. You collaborated with Ahmed. Well, in fact, you made Ahmed's work, Ahmed in Copperland. Yes. Yeah? Could you could you explain before we get on to the ex <laughs> to the to the work itself a little bit about what you do as a mixologist? Because I also know that you're a um, you're you're a bar you've been a bartender in quite a famous bar in Amsterdam for a while as yes. well, haven't you? Yes. So. so yeah, well mixologist is just a fancy word for a bartender who makes cocktails. Yeah. Um so I'm a bartender who makes cocktails. And besides working at Door 74, I am um, uh, yeah, I'm a freelance hospitality professional. Right. So I work a lot with different brands and create drinks for them or recipes for them uh, on how to promote their drinks or their spirits. Um but I also give a lot of workshops, trainings. I do a lot. As long as it's like drink related, it's uh, something I do. Lots of people would think it was the ideal job. You would it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and but you're also interested in the um, in the in the kind of sociology of drinking, aren't yeah, you? In the yes. history. So I, I know that you you are currently writing or have written a book on Geneva on Dutch gin. True. Yeah, I'm actually writing it at the moment still. Okay. Uh, I finished my um, uh, sociology masters and I did uh, my thesis on drinking cultures and specifically on uh, Dutch drinking cultures of uh, Geneva. And um, uh, so I had all this research and it was like ac academic research. So I'm still rewriting it and getting more for, uh, for a broader public. But Great. yes, we look forward <laughs> to it. Uh, so tell me about your relationship with Ahmed. How long have you known him? I've known him, I think, five or six years now. Yeah. So he showed up once at Door 24 at my bar. And yeah, he was a, he became a regular and we became friends. And uh, yeah, so it was more of like a friendship base. And then, uh, yeah, a couple months ago, he, um, it was his recent, our collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, he asked me to, uh, uh, to join him in, a, in his new exhibition. Mm -hmm. 
So it was more on a friendly, friendly basis. Okay, so tell me about this cocktail, Ahmed in Copperland. What, what, what, what is it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's, um, uh, well, he had uh, an exhibition in uh, the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven in Holland. And it was a, um, yeah, a, co a collection of um, more of his works from the past. And these guys, the band, they made a, a soundtrack to every piece. And then as a third layer, I uh, paired a cocktail to the whole art. So it was yeah, a lot of different, different dimensions. Uh, and I tried to capture that in the cocktail, in the drink itself. And it involved dry ice? Yes, yes. Okay. Can so you I, explain how that works? Of course. Well, it was a, a lot about senses. So of okay. course, Ahmed was like the visual aspect. Mm -hmm. Then these guys made sure of the audio. Mm -hmm. And I did uh, the smell and taste uh, you know, in one drink then. Um, so I used dry ice and uh, like in a, in a blazer kind of way. So people would think it was a, um, a warm drink, but it was cold. And then the other preparation was like a layered preparation. So I, I, as a garnish, I used a, a smoke, also a dry ice smoke. And dry ice, um, it transports aroma. So I used a different aroma than actual the cocktail was. So it was like if you would drink it, then you first smell something else and expect something else. So kind mm. of fooling the brain. <laughs> so it doesn't sound to me like Ahmed did very much himself at all. No, for he this never one. does. <laughs> no. no. Okay. No, so it was a uh, yeah. How do you feel about that? Good. I mean, is it your work or is it Ahmed's work? It's our work. Okay. Because it was like oh, like uh, the the music was done by these guys, and of course it was a collaboration. So um, I was building forth on what they already done. Like so, it was first Ahmed's pieces because they they were already created. Then they made a soundtrack, and then as a third layer, I used those two as my inspiration for my creation. But the, the actual work <laughs> itself, Ahmed in Copperland, is your work. It's not Ahmed's work, surely. Well, the, the recipe is my recipe, yeah. um, but it was inspired by him. So oh. it's because I know yeah. Copperland is the translation of the town he was born in. Yeah, it's his into birthplace. Into his birthplace yes. into English. Yes. Okay. So he's kind of branded it yes. in a certain way. He stole it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's interesting. So how, did you, how do you feel about working with Ahmed? Do you think you'll work with him again in the future? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. he's still a friend. So we, we, we started as friends and we did this uh, thing together. It was more of like a, a nice event. It was yeah. a one, one evening. So. And then we're still friends. So. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So it hasn't, it hasn't damaged your <laughs> relationship with Ahmed? No, no, Him no. stealing your work? No, he okay. didn't steal it. <laughs> okay. He paid for it. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, at least he paid for it. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. That's good to know. Okay, <laughs> Tess, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
to go into the, the centre of that town and read out a proclamation inviting everyone to the Liverpool Biennial. And did it work? Did it all run smoothly? Yes, it was not as simple as it sounds. It was um, having to gallop a horse along the track at the side of a road whilst there's traffic on one side and fences on the other side of you and then having to go into the town centre and stand in front of a town hall with lots of people around you. It's difficult for the horse. Dressed as a postman as well? Dressed as a postman, but yes. But then you're used to being dressed up in different costumes for your work. Yes. And um, how did you feel, having finished the collaboration, how did you feel about your um, relationship with Ahmed? Was it a good one? Was it a positive experience that you had? My relationship, I feel, has always been good with Ahmed. Ahmed was excellent whilst we were filming. Um, he listened to what I had to say, what was possible and what was not possible, and I tried to interpret what he wanted to see on film. So did you feel that you, um, because of course you're an actor, that's part of your role, um, did you feel that your interpretation was essential to the artwork that was produced? Uh, I felt that, yes, it needed to obviously be seen to be believed. Ahmed was directing you, but was it your work or was it Ahmed's work? It most definitely was his work, not right. mine. Well, Wayne, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs>
Automatically? Yes. Yes? Okay. So you are knowledgeable about this because you're a fireman? Yes. Yes. Okay. So how, how do you, did, when you distributed the books in Helsinki, did you, um, how did people receive the books from you? Were they happy to have these books? No. So in the, at the beginning, uh, people were quite afraid of um, approaching us and did, they were just looking uh, at us from far away from the distance. But then as the first person came about, uh, everyone realized that they were getting something Something for free. Everybody <laughs> likes a free yes, book. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course, absolutely. So finally, uh, Jakko, how um, did you feel about the collaboration with Ahmed? Was he an interesting person to collaborate with? Did you understand what he was trying to do? <sighs> <laughs> no, se oli tosi mielenkiintoista, että. Um, so yes, it was um, really interesting how Ahmed, Ahmed was uh, reversing the idea of the Fahrenheit um, original novel. Um, and so we were in a way, in our way, saving the world, giving back what they burned then, we were now giving back to people the books. Jaco, thank you very much. <laughs> you were done. It's very nice to have you here with us. You're uh, an auctioneer for Christie's and you work in Amsterdam, but you also, you also um, often work internationally. I also know you do lots of charity work on behalf of Christie's. Mm -hmm. It's a little advert for a, a major <laughs> auction house. So, Bento, you were in the uh, Ahmed production project, Punch This Painting. True. Yeah? yeah? Before we go on to talk about Punch This Painting, tell me a little bit about your work as an auctioneer. Um, well, I do a lot of auctioneering on the side, actually. Um, my main job um, is I'm a specialist at the modern art department in mm -hmm. Amsterdam. So I specialize uh, on art between 1900 and 1950. So I do a lot of valuations, um, I make the catalog, do research, um, and in the end, I sell it as well. So um, I do the auctioneering for Christie's and for charities. Uh, as well, so that's uh, that's my daily job. Yeah. Okay. And could you could you describe um, the project punch this painting? Yeah, Ahmed uh, asked me to um, to to do um, um, an auction of a painting by uh, himself of himself hanging uh, here. Punch this painting, and um, we uh, had a gathering in uh, a gallery in Amsterdam in the Jordaan, and. Um, uh, well, people were gathered, um, there were a, a crew, uh, people helping uh, with um, bidders on the telephone. And then were they real bidders? They were real bidders, okay. yes. There was a bidder from Istanbul. I think in the end he bought the painting, okay. uh, the, the phone bidder, yeah. So we went, um, uh, gathered, everyone came in. I needed to go on to the rostrum, uh, where, um, well, the, the wooden thing where uh, you stand on as an auctioneer. And um, after some, uh, some bidding, uh, in the end, the painting uh, sold. Um, and, um, and that was it, actually. And so the thing was that whoever bought the painting, they were allowed to punch the painting if they liked. But um, that, that, that did not happen uh, at that moment. Um, maybe that was because of the buyer was in Istanbul <laughs> at the time, so he couldn't. But uh, yes, that's... Um, My understanding is that it's not only the buyer that is allowed to, or the collector that is allowed yeah. to punch the painting, but that when the painting is displayed in public, the collector needs to allow anybody to be able to punch the painting. Uh, yes, yes, right. yes. As far as you know, has anybody punched the painting? As far as I know, uh, no. Right. No, no, it's still, but uh, um, Ahmed told me it hasn't been exhibited since. Oh. So um, the time will come, maybe. So yeah. this is not a way to encourage private collectors to allow public institutions to uh, display their work, is it? Well, you know, yeah. I have a, qu a professional question for you. Yeah. Um, do you think, in your uh, expertise as mm -hmm. somebody who values work on a regular basis. Yeah. If the painting were to be punched, would it rise in value or go down in value? Well, I don't know. Uh, the thing is, um, you cannot punch it anymore then. So um, I don't know if it will, will, will be worth more. Uh, of course, it's always hard to say as you only know the value uh, when you sell it again. 
Yes. So uh, that's it's it's difficult to say, but I would say that a painting that you can punch and can be punched, um, that it's that's makes it um, exciting, and that that you know otherwise you lose the. Um, yeah, the excitement and the thing that it might happen. Okay. Will it happen today or tomorrow? That's true. Yeah. Obviously, you're an expert in, in modern art, so you're aware of the fact that uh, the 20th century is full of these, um, uh, these, these strange gestures by artists. But when you heard uh, Ahmed wanted the painting to be punched, mm -hmm. uh, potentially, mm -hmm. what did you think of him? I thought it was really, um, I thought it was special, especially, I mean, if you do that with a self-portrait, of course. Um, I, I hadn't seen it before, so it was, uh, it really was something special, I thought, yeah, yeah. Don't you think it, it suggests some form of psychological damage on behalf of uh, Maybe, <laughs> maybe, but uh, no, well, yeah, no, I thought it was uh, exciting, you know, and to be able to do that as an artist uh, and to explore that and also for an artist to see when that is going to happen and why, um, that's, um, that, yeah, yeah it, it must be interesting, especially for himself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're being very nice about yeah, him. Yeah, well, Did you, do, do you have a good relationship with him? This was... Uh, we didn't know each other. Ah. Um, so, uh, and, and it was a, a short project. I mean, I was in and out, actually, to, you know, I saw the painting and that was that. Right. Uh, and then we stayed for a drink and then, and that was that. So I didn't, at the time, I didn't feel really... Uh, as if it was me also being a part of of the artwork itself. It's sort of when uh, when we are now here together and we were talking about it, and it, it sort of you know it was oh yeah yeah I I really was a part of it and uh, yeah okay. so I di it didn't feel like that at the time. It, it felt like my normal job that I did sort yeah. of. For a project. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one final question for you, and you might not be able to reveal the answer to this question, which is. How much was it sold for? I'm not sure exactly, but I think it was 3,000 euros. Okay. But so you helped in him the make some money. Yeah. Yeah, well. Okay. <laughs> Benta, thank you very much. Thank you. Bora, a kinship talk. You are an artist. Yeah. What kind of artist are you? High definition artist. A high definition HD. artist. HD. HD. You're a musician as also, well. Yeah. An experimental musician? A synthetic musician. A synthetic musician. Okay. Artificial. Okay. So. And you um, have collaborated a lot, it seems, with the artist. Yes. Well, yeah. Not three th times now. Three times. Exactly. So, and you play in a band. Yeah. I'm Fino the Blendex. You're one the of founder. the founding members of the band Fino Blendex. I do vocals and that's basically all I do. Okay. That's why I okay. call myself a synthetic okay. musician. Do you play any instruments? Well, I play like 1% of everything. Okay. Like, yeah. so, so you're I'm, not I'm really a very bad. talented? No, no, I'm not. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. But you, He's you, a talented. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not interviewing him, I'm yeah. interviewing you. Exactly. Okay. So um, tell me a little bit about the collaboration, the specific collaboration that you've done with Ahmed uh, recently as part of his exhibition Forward at the Van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven. Yeah, so we met with Ahmed um, years ago at a friend's club uh, in Istanbul. And then he was coming and going to London and he basically, I was recording with my friend from Fino Blandax in his bedroom and he was just visiting us and he really liked what we were doing so he, he, he approached, approached us to do this collaboration but not exactly it's not specifically for the one up thing but um okay. that was first the ica uh, gig that we did and then he was really happy with it and then we wanted he wanted us to uh, collaborate on the one up exhibition that he had the uh, retrospective tell me uh, tell me about one of the first collaborative songs that you produced together or pieces of music? Well, the first one we did actually was that day when we were recording at my friend's bedroom and he came for a visit. And uh, he had this idea of um, turning emails into lyrics. So we were just jamming and... Like he, a typical artist idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he just picked my phone and he asked me if it's okay to use one of my emails and then he, he basically turned that into lyrics. That was... Uh, actually, one of the songs that that one of the songs turned out to be uh, at the, the the album for the uh, the reverb. 
Okay. Yeah. Which is the which is debit debit and that was um, that was actually my flatmate. Uh, my flatmate's email to me asking me for uh, for the uh, the bills because I hadn't paid for them, and uh, he had no money left and he wanted me to. So like the, the word debit kept on coming. You know, that's, mm. you know, you have I'm I'm like you have to pay me. My debit card is like uh, I, I don't know. They're gonna take my debit card away from me. Stuff like that. Yeah. So, so. And how did you feel about having all this information about you? Because it's not very I'm, nice. Oh. Well, yeah, I'm okay with it. I'm yeah? a struggling artist, so that's... that's yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, and, and you have a good relationship with Ahmed? Yeah, we do, we're yeah. friends, yeah. Yeah, but as, as artists, you're both artists, do you feel uh, a rivalry? No, I don't. I mean, you don't have a retrospective at the Van Abbey Museum. Yeah, because I do different kind of stuff compared okay. to what he's doing, so it's okay. not... You he's do synthetic stuff? I do, yeah, I do fake stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. He, and he does and real... Ahmed doesn't do fake stuff? <laughs> He does real art. He does real art. He does real okay. Art. Well, I think maybe we'll end it there uh, oh, on yeah, the sure. basis of Ahmed doing real art and you not doing real well, art. Well, actually, that's my fake opinion. So okay. Yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Bora, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Alexander Pikert, it's very nice to have you here. You're a hairdresser, you work in Kreuzberg in Berlin, mm -hmm. and you have a salon called Alex and Antje. Yes. Yeah? And you collaborated with Ahmed on the project Another Perfect Day, mm -hmm. which was for the Berlin Biennial a few editions ago. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about your role as a hairdresser? Meine Rolle, uh... um, I was invited by Kunstwerke in Berlin um, to participate um, by, a, um, by a performance um, and that had to, be, uh, had to take place in a basement in the Kunstwerke where I had to cut hair. Um, ich kannte Ahmed bis dahin noch gar nicht. Um, ich kam dahin, wir haben uns kurz... Um, I didn't know Ahmed very well by then and it went all very, really quickly. Um, and we started this performance with me cutting hair of, of a person and the, the, the room was, um, the, the only light source was coming from um, a motor, motorbike, um, which beam was shining through win open window from, from the courtyard. Uh, I'm uh, aware of the, the artist having been inspired for this work by the informal ways in which in Turkey and Istanbul particularly, um, people have to improvise when there are power cuts, when there are power shortages in daily life. Ganz genau. Yeah? So, um, how, how was it cutting hair um, just in the glare of the, uh, the headlights of a motorcycle? Yeah, das uh, war wirklich sehr interessant. It was a really interesting um, experience for me, um, cutting hair in almost like in the dark, and um, I was quite glad that I didn't really injure yeah. my, the, the person I, cutting, I was cutting the hair as well as myself, and I was also quite happy that the haircut turned out really nice. Oh, yeah. did it? Yeah. Um, well, so you just did one haircut? Just one haircut, okay. yeah, for one hour. Were they happy with their haircut? Uh, yeah, sehr. Also, ich habe es jetzt nach sieben Jahren. I just heard it seven years after from Ahmed here at the Chisholm Hale that this guy liked his haircut very much. But, yeah. So you have to wait for seven years. <laughs> yeah, for the, I have to wait for, for seven the years. Praise. Yeah. yeah. yeah. yeah. Um, so is the haircut the art, or is the is the person the art, or are you the artist, or is Ahmed the artist? Um, ich würde schon sagen, dass uh, Ahmed Künstler ist. Ich habe dazu beigetragen. I would definitely say that uh, Ahmed is the artist, um, even though I contrib contributed to it and I was part of it, but I'm very sure that he's the artist. Yes. Okay. Um, I think some people would disagree with you, but anyway. Um, were you aware, because I was at this performance, and I was outside and I couldn't get in, there was a big, were you aware there was a big riot going on outside? because so many people were trying to look and the police came and they had to set up <laughs> barriers because so many people were trying to watch you cutting the hair. Ja. You ja. were aware? Ja, ja. Ich habe es dann später erst erfahren, wie viele Menschen tatsächlich draußen waren. Ich selber wusste das gar nicht, mein Modell auch nicht. Wir 
haben es uns da so gemütlich. I didn't know it by then while we were while I was cutting the hair like we were actually feeling quite quite cozy downstairs and um, it just eventually after the performance we heard that there were like a lot of people around and that even like police was was has been called in. Schon sehr interessant. Yeah. It's a serious breach of the peace. Do you think that the artist um, should take responsibility for this? Uh, yeah, auf jeden Fall. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I understood your response. Alex, thank you very much. Ich danke auch. Mulugeta Fikadu, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Unusually, um, amongst the collaborations that Ahmed has uh, developed with you, this is not an art project we're talking about, but rather a platform that you've created. I'd like you to start off by telling us a little bit about your background, because I know that you're a lecturer and an academic specialist, but also that you're an asylum seeker in the UK. Well, uh, this is a long story. I uh, can't tell you all the uh, story right now. Uh, just a, a, I'm an Eritrean, a born in Eritrea, and uh, I moved when I was a young boy to Cuba. I grew up in Cuba, I lived all my life there. And uh, in 2008, uh, I found my real family, my dad and my brother. So I decided to back to Eritrea. And in Eritrea happened, things happened to me, and then I ended up in the UK. Asylum. Okay. And uh, was that difficult? How did you get out of Eritrea? Well, very difficult. I'm lucky. It's quite difficult. Uh, uh, I came here, I escaped from the prison. I was uh, detained in the prison and then I escaped from that. Uh. And this platform that you've set up in collaboration with Ahmed, the Silent University, can you tell us a little bit about what the platform is? Well, First of all, I didn't set up that platform. We is group of okay. asylum seekers and uh, refugees with uh, with academic background. We we uh, with the idea the, the idea of uh, uh, Hamad, and uh, we start uh, open uh, without barrier. I mean language. There is no limit of language if you to give the lecture or uh, the consultant or the researchers, which has been divided in three. Mm. So it is wide. Anyone can put uh, his own, and even in his own language, myself, um, I'm privileged of that. So I speak Portuguese, I speak Spanish, which is my comfortable language. Mm. So I, I put true and, and that language and to lecture and and you do these lectures uh, and they are they are developed on they are also published online yeah but i understand that the only people that get access to them are people that have signed up to be members of the silent Union. yes uh, to be it is, is open the platform is open is exchanging knowledge mm -hmm. not just for for uh, uh we we don't we don't give something without getting something from the people. It's no money. Yeah. It's knowledge, sharing yeah. knowledge. It's, it's a exchange. platform, yeah, yeah. exchanging, yeah. yeah. And what is it that your particular, what knowledge do you contribute in particular? What's your area of academic specialism? Well, my area is, uh, uh, which I decided to do it, is an, an, an sexual uh, transmission uh, infection disease. Yeah. yeah. And you, you say it's a knowledge exchange. So, do you feel that you have um, benefited from receiving knowledge yes, yourself? Yes, of course, yeah, yeah. So, could you maybe tell us a little bit about some of the things you have learned through the Silent Universe? Well, I learned one of the big things uh, is for me, which I get from the Silent University, is especially in the group, okay. in the group, in the group which have been involved in that, uh, and from the beginning. And you had different, different people with different background, with different knowledge, and I learn from them a lot. The other thing which I learn is, is being, being 
back again uh, in the social uh, term, you know, uh, getting back your confidence. Okay. That, yeah. is very, that, that is very important uh, to me. And I understand that there are now um, silent universities that have been set up in a number of different cities in Europe. Can you tell me how, how they emerge? How, how do they get set up? Well, it's, it, it's, it's quite... Uh, uh, for me, it was so, uh, it, when I heard from Mohammed, uh, Ahmad, he said, uh, well, I'm going to go somewhere uh, like Germany or um, Stockholm. Uh, I'm going to try to sit up that mm -hmm. to... They said, hey, it's crazy. Who's going who's gonna to listen to him? <laughs> No one can. We, we we don't see the benefit of the beginning, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's uh, quite amazing. So yeah, the other thing is we we been awarded from I think is visual uh, award. So you got yeah. an uh, award. Well, we we yeah. your, the silent university yes, got yes, an award. Yes. Well, that's fantastic. So Mulu Gessa, thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Good, Heko. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you. You were in the project by Ahmed called The Muscles Behind My Eyes Ache from the Strain. But before we talk about your part in that project, I want you to tell me a little bit about your job as a speech therapist and as a lip reader. Ben dok okuma uzmanıyım. Aynı zamanda dil ve konuşma bozuklukları üzerine de uzmanım. I'm a lip reader. Um, I'm an expert in lip reading and I also help uh, speech disabled people and I'm, a, I'm the president of the Speech Disabled Federation. I believe you're the first and only lip reader in Turkey. Evet, bu konuda doğru. Bu konuyla ilgilenen çok yoğun bir şekilde Yes, I'm the only one who has focused on this so much and it's uh, very interesting that I'm the only one. And you also help the police with lip reading and you solve football disputes through lip reading hmm. as well, don't you? Mm -hmm. Tabii dudak okuma uzmanı olduğum için hem e, güvenlik kuvvetlerine I'm going to the court to help the cases and also I I lip read the football videos and tell what was going on. So tell me now about the work you made with um, Ahmed. Could you explain how, where you were and where Ahmed was and how you were communicating with each other? Uh, Ahmed le, uh... İstanbul'da e, Galata Kulesi'ne çıkmıştı kendisi. Ahmet went up Galata Tower and I was in the terrace um, opposite it with the audience and I had binoculars and I was watching what Ahmet was saying. I was reading his lips with the binoculars and uh, the audience was listening to what I was telling them. And it was the first time that lip reading was used in another field um, in art. It was very exciting for me to be a part of it this way. And uh, we were speaking about, uh, we met with Ahmed before um, the performance and he gave me a text. He spoke about the balloon that was shot and um, the money that was stolen as part of the performance. So the text was um, uh, a story, the stories of about six works that Ahmed had already made that in some way had been interrupted or changed in some way by um, other participants yeah what what do you think of your role in this performance yani orada dudak okumanın e, sağlanmasını dudak okumayı sağlamak i was carrying ahmed's message through reading lips and do you think it's good for ahmed to use other people to carry his messages Kesinlikle sanatçı uh, the artist's role is to deliver the message in any way possible mod by modifying anything that's given to him. Buzgo, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey sir, Zaydevag, you have collaborated recently with Ahmed on his retrospective at the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven called Forward. Yeah? That's right. Now, 
how would you describe your collaboration? Because you're a designer. Our collaboration started with a request from the Van Abbe Museum uh, if I could function as an interlocutor uh, initially. Uh, that grew in sort of a question if I could design, campaign and do publicity for the show. And it grew further by me doing all the exhibition design in the end. So there's a lot of stuff going on right. all of a sudden. So your role grew and grew. Yeah. Yeah. yeah. And were you happy with that? Yeah, I was happy about it. Yeah. Okay. So like Did they I pay you well? I, pay, I was paid very well, yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> You're a particular kind of designer, aren't mm -hmm. you? You come from a Dutch tradition mm -hmm. where you speculate on a situation, you do lots and lots of research before you come up with design solutions. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it is in, in a sense, it is, um, it is a luxury in a, in, a, in a way that you have sort of the chance or the ability to have a very open conversation with your commissioners and that they are sort of well trained through the years, through the decades, as, at least in Holland that is, uh, uh, to think along, to, be, have, uh, to ask open questions in a, in a certain manner. And so if you sort of really focus on this way of working, then after a while, um, uh, uh, you know, you're sort of known for it. So even if you go abroad, sort of like people know that that will be part of the package. Okay. Was that openness in your relationship with Ahmed or did he just tell you what to do? Uh, that was completely part of it. And especially um, when we first started, it started thinking about sort of campaign and publicity. Uh, there was this sort of interesting aspect that I sort of he opened up sort of his Insta Instagram account, sort of his personal life for me to dig into and see like how I could sort of use it and sort of combine it with uh, uh, well the, one of the or representational uh, images of the 20 works that were on on display within the museum and sort of that sort of went and went rather deep in in a certain way and and that sort that was still within sort of the the context of me being comfortable uh, and me doing my job as I most regularly do <laughs> and was there anything interesting in his instagram account uh, the, the, yeah, there's something in that sense that is interesting that almost everything that he wants uh, uh, or all works that he, that he uh, conceived are they're presented as ideas, uh, as afterthoughts, as uh, sort of he, after a while he recognizes parts or details. And uh, I would not make predictions about it. Like if I had to, I could, I, I might sort of uh, take a gamble and predict what some of the next work would be about. Okay, well we <laughs> might come back to that later. <laughs> What is it like collaborating with Ahmed in contrast to all the other collaborations that you have to participate in as a designer? Mm. Is it different? It is. There's a, a couple of things are different. Let's say that I would make a, a book of a photographer. He has a, uh, a collection of, of, of images. Uh, he has an idea what the book is uh, going to be about. But sort of the collaborate within the collaboration, the story is not finished. So within the collaboration, there's a lot of possibility also for me sort of to, uh, to together make sort of a next step. Of course, the thing is with, a, with, a, with an artist, with an author, is that these kind of, uh, uh, it is a finished, it's a finished narrative. So in the context of, for instance, the Fanaba show, uh, there were some works that you almost crossed the line, I think, or I almost crossed the line in that uh, an audience walks into sort of the very traditional setting of a museum of a retrospect uh, and they, uh, they perceive it as that everything is done by the artist. But of course, there's a huge team of, of curators, of technical people, of uh, uh, uh, carpenters, uh, and for instance, also me. And then that's the small little difference or the, the small detail, like I also can conceive myself, you know? The, so mm -hmm. I'm sort of somewhere uh, uh, in, the, in the middle. And so- Can what, I just say yeah? you're sounding quite cross about that? No, no, no, not across at all. Oh. The, the strange thing is sort of that there might, might have only been one or two works. So I, uh, there's, there's no question of uh, uh, wanting more credits. I'm like, I'm fine. I've, like, I, I love my position. I love the collaboration. It is more that I almost, within some works, I think there was uh, too much design. Uh, mm -hmm. That I, there should be, it should have been less of me. Oh, okay. So. Oh, well, sadly, we can't ask Ahmed what his opinion is of that. <laughs> so, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to try and decide the decision ourselves. So you weren't cross at all about uh, the fact that you became very close as collaborators, and yet the main sign on the outside of the Van Abe Museum is Ahmed Oud. No, no, that's, that's part of the deal. 
okay. that that's that's the game that that we're playing. So, and so that's my position. And what I what I was saying is, it is rather awkward that I'm I'm used to working in commissions and I'm fine by it. But it's like you you get so close. It is uh, an artist versus a designer. Uh, uh, things get so close at a certain point uh, that things start to sort of cross over here and there. Uh, uh, but everyone knows what sort of uh, what the starting position is and everyone is like i'm completely fine with it and happy and therefore like i still love the collaboration oh you're very generous <laughs> very nice of you thank you very much peter <laughs>
Yeah. You see signals, or you're like a sort of you have sort of you see sort of things that he's looking at, sort of, and, and again, and again, and again, sort of, and it's like no, no, no, it's not, it's not, it's like that one little spark that sort of uh, makes an artist an artist, sort of. And uh. Sometimes you can read a little in between the lines that you think like that's gonna happen, but no, I'm not gonna say no. It's a private Instagram account, so. Well, I have to say that I think Ahmed is a lucky guy because he's got some very loyal collaborators here. <laughs> well, maybe excluding Bora. You know. OK, so let's have some questions from the audience. I have a question for you, Andrea. Yes. What, how did you um, first meet Ahmed? What is your job, and how do you feel about the collaboration that you are doing with him right now? <laughs> Thank you very much. I first met Ahmed formally on a dance floor in Stockholm. Um, I feel that I've had to learn a lot over the past two days in order to be able to establish this performance. And my job is as a professor at Goldsmith. Who is the artist in this situation? I think it's probably me. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Uh, hi, Kerry Dingle, director of the Citizen TV project filming today. Quick question, really for Yakau, the fireman, is it important that you agree with Ahmet's political message in your piece of art, a very strong free speech message? Can you ever collaborate if you don't politically empathize? Hey, don't I work on the sky? Oh, no, he doesn't think you have to, to agree with the political agenda or whatsoever because uh, Yako was working for Ahmet and he was getting paid for it, so doesn't really matter. I'd like to ask Kerry's question of Mulugeta. Do you think it's important uh, to agree with the politics of Ahmed's work in order to collaborate? Uh, well, I hate politics. Okay. First of all, because politics always mess up the life of people. It is my opinion. Um, if it's in terms of politics, I don't collaborate with them. Oh, OK. No. OK. So this is a very different view. Thank you very much. Another question? Are there any of you for whom being involved in a collaboration with Ahmet has changed how you view art? Maybe you weren't interested in art, and now you are. Maybe you liked a certain kind of art, and maybe it's, it's changed it for you, and maybe you hate art altogether, and you would never be involved in anything again. Also ich habe äh, in meinem eigenen Freundeskreis auch selber sehr viele Künstler und ähm, äh, helfe auch manchmal bei gewissen... Um, I have actually quite a few um, artist friends and I'm also collaborating with other artists and do my own projects even. Um, but it um, hasn't really changed my view on, on contemporary art working with uh, Ahmed. It was interesting and yeah, but it hasn't really changed it. On that basis, I think we've run out of time. I'm getting the signals. So um, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Of course, thank the collaborators for revealing so much of themselves and of Ahmad Oud today. But thank you very much for coming, and uh, I hope you've had uh, a nice time. Thank you very much. <laughs>